want a war, you're gonna get one. Now get the gun, the trust, to my generation, I'll take the fall, the saints, and the cross of nations, and it's a sex, the gods, the freaks, the frauds, the best you with me, go, go, come on, let's get out, to the music, play that fucking music, listen to my music, Welcome to episode 90 of Reliving the War and welcome to the 30th of June 1997. You know how it works, Raw's live tonight from Des Moines, Iowa, while WCW are putting on a hyped up show from Las Vegas, Nevada. This is the night where the Impact player gets revealed on Nitro. The commentators have talked about this quite a lot and they don't stop talking about it throughout this whole Nitro broadcast. On Raw, fans are going to hear The Undertaker's secret when Paul Bearer spills the beans, so it sounds like we've got two interesting shows this week. We kick things off on Raw with a Ken Shamrock vs Triple H match while Ric Flair cuts a promo on Nitro. We also have a Juventud Guerrera vs Chris Jericho match. Ric Flair brings two ladies to the ring and those ladies are holding a creepy Roddy Piper mannequin. Kinda reminds me of when Goldust done the same thing back in 1996, remember that? Flair says he gave Piper a night with these two women and this is what's left of the hot rod. Horseman business can do crazy things to a man. One of them wants to know why they call him the hot rod cause Piper isn't hot. This cracks Flair up and it wasn't even that funny. Flair says Piper crossed the line last week when he tried to tell Rick how to wrestle a wrestling match. He then echoes what Hulk Hogan said a few months back and what Guile says when he wins in Street Fighter and he tells Piper to go home and be a family man. And the Las Vegas ladies totally screw up when Mean Gene asks them if Ric Flair is truly the 60 minute man. Well, is he truly the 60 minute man? Like 30 seconds. What? One doesn't even know where she is and one wasn't paying attention at all. Well done. Flair says the kilt is all that's left of the hot rod. They have a moment to reflect on Roddy's career and Mean Gene gets himself prepared for some serious, no nonsense, filthy horseman business as the promo comes to an end. Ric Flair vs Roddy Piper is gonna take place at Bash at the Beach. After the commentators try to rope you into not switching over to the USA Network, we go to our first match. Juventud Guerrera vs Cruiserweight Champion Chris Jericho. Uh, Cruiserweight Champion? Yeah, Chris won the belt at a Saturday Nitro house show two nights prior. He won the belt in 30 seconds. Six wrestled Rey Mysterio before having this match with Y2J. Saturday Nitro was broadcasted on the internet but it was only an audio feed. I don't think the match was officially taped. The commentators use this match to hype up the mystery impact player who's going to appear tonight on Nitro. They hype up Rodman and Hogan vs Giant Package at Bash at the Beach. And I hate to highlight stuff like this but Juventud Guerrera absolutely sucked in this match. He almost brained himself when performing a Hurricane Rana and he fucked up twice when performing springboard moves. Not a great night for the juice and even the commentators mentioned that Hoovy was off. He tried to make up for it though to his credit but in the end. Jericho pulled off an incredible super frankensteiner and he followed this up with the lion tamer. Chris gets the win. The standard is set so high for the cruiserweights at this point and that means the botches can really stand out sometimes. Jericho says afterwards to Mean Gene that the cruiserweight belt isn't an NWO belt anymore, it's a WCW belt. Six comes out and he says Chris beat nothing on Saturday night until he went back to his hotel room that night. Amazing. Even Chris had to applaud that one. Six says he's still the champ and he'll give Jericho another shot. He then slaps Chris across the face. Keep an eye on Mean Gene here, he gets a bit tangled up. And Nitro takes a break while Chris and Six continue to fight. Before his match with Kenny Boy Shamrock, Hunter says he has something better than the world's most dangerous man, the world's most dangerous woman. Triple H mocks Shamrock on his way to the ring, and the match they have here is pretty straightforward. Ken keeps catching Triple H out at the beginning of the bout and Hunter eventually has to cheat to get an advantage. The Earl Hebner vs Triple H rivalry continues when Hebner has to pull Hunter by the hair when Trips won't stop attacking Shamrock. And when China gets involved on the outside and Shamrock gets thrown into the steps, Mick Foley makes an appearance. Mankind distracts Hunter long enough for Kenny Boy to wake up, Ken hits a belly to belly suplex and the king of the ring gets pinned by the world's most dangerous man. 
Triple H vs Mankind takes place this Sunday at Canadian Stampede, while Shamrock's involved in the 10 man tag main event. Just a reminder that I covered the whole Canadian Stampede pay per view previously, it isn't in the same reliving the war format but there's no point in me going over it again, so you can check that video out right after today's video if you want to keep up with the timeline. After the bout we get a recap of the Nation vs Dirty Old Assholes fight from last week, and we see Ahmed afterwards in the Texas Orthopedic Hospital. Ahmed says that The Undertaker was responsible and it was The Undertaker who sent DOA to the ring, and listen to this, listen to what Ahmed calls the DOA. Whatever you want to call them, biker, Michael liker, whatever they are. <laughs> Bi biker, Michael liker, <laughs> let's hear that one more time. Whatever you want to call them, biker, Michael liker, whatever they are. But ever you wanna call him, Biker Michael Liker. <laughs> this is some prime kicker be kicking shit right here, guys. Johnson says the tendons in his leg have been ripped, but when he comes back, he's going after The Undertaker and the dirty old assholes. This just wouldn't happen, and you should consider Ahmed's push completely over at this point. It definitely sucks for Ahmed. <laughs> but Michael Michael Likers. <laughs> is it like bikers who like Michael Jackson or something? Michael Jordan? Michael J. Fox? Who knows? I absolutely love it though. The Nation take on the Legion of Doom up next on Raw while Dean Malenko battles Eddie Guerrero on Nitro. Officials are still trying to break up Jericho and Six. Alex Wright then makes a surprise appearance where he says he never gets interview time. WCW's held him back. Referees made bad decisions against him, and it's all because he's from Germany. He also says he has a great body and Lex Luger has nothing on Das Wunderkind, and then Mean Gene has to rush the segment on, and that's it. No dancing, no Saturday Right Fever. God damn it. No Saturday Right Fever this week. Fucking shit. I'm surprised, but not surprised that this Guerrero vs Malenko match is taking place on Nitro. There's more story behind this match when compared to their previous Nitro encounters, and I think this could have warranted another pay per view match. Neither man gets featured at Bash at the Beach. Eddie's in ring return to Nitro then, and he starts it off by attacking Malenko on the outside. Dane gets thrown into the steps, and when the match gets in the ring, Malenko gets floored with a hard clothesline. Eddie twists his foot on Dean's face and it looks like Guerrero's really enjoying himself here. Eddie hits a suplex followed by a jumping elbow attack. He misses a senton from the apron but a quick recovery sees Guerrero going back to the apron and Malenko gets his head smashed in the top turnbuckle. A fight in the corner leads to Malenko countering a tornado DDT and Guerrero gets launched across the ring. Dean finally starts fighting back with a few shots in the corner. He hits a spinning side suplex, and Eddie goes down after a jumping heel kick. Malenko keeps the pressure on with a crowd pleasing powerbomb, but then Chavo Guerrero shows up. Chavo jumps on the apron and he starts cheering on his uncle. Malenko gets distracted. Eddie takes advantage, and Eddie hits a brain buster, followed by the frog splash. Eddie Guerrero defeats Dean Malenko on Monday Nitro. The commentators wonder what Chavo's intentions were, and they wonder if this was a plan all along. Chavo seems a bit confused as he and Eddie head back up the entranceway. Immediately afterwards, Rey Mysterio comes out to challenge Kevin Nash. Mysterio recalls getting thrown into a trailer last year, he recalls the NWO run ins during his matches with Six. There's a big size difference, of course, but Rey wants to take on Kevin Nash tonight on Nitro. Kevin comes out and he says Ray's been reading too many bedtime stories, such as the little engine that could. Nash accepts the challenge, so that one will happen later on Nitro. Ray Ray's completely fucked. On Raw, Michael Cole makes his WWF debut when he interviews the Legion of Doom. People give Cole a lot of shit, but this dude has had an incredibly long run in the WWE, all things considered. He's going to replace Todd Pettengill soon as the main backstage interview guy, and as much props as we can give Cole for longevity, the Toddster is still top dog around these neck of the woods. Animal says there hasn't been a team that's come close to beating the LOD legally. That tells me that the Road Warriors are way too easy to outsmart. And Hawk tells the nation to get ready to enter Road Warrior World in tonight's match. I imagine it looking like Disney World, only it's got a Legion of Doom theme. I'm begging an artistic viewer to draw up Road Warrior World and send me it over. There's going to be a million dollar giveaway at SummerSlam, and Sonny stands beside the cash. There's a million dollars in that casket, ladies and gentlemen. And Vince says there's going to be some clues given out later regarding how one goes about winning that one million dollars. 
So this is a tag team tournament match. Here's the brackets. The Headbangers versus Owen and Bulldog happens later on. So we'll see how Davey's doing with his chin lock rehabilitation. Hawk and Animal do indeed take D'Lo and Farouk to Road Warrior World, but there's a problem. The Godwins are standing at the entranceway watching the match unfold. After hitting a doomsday device, Henry hits the ring and Hawk gets whacked with the bucket. Farouk then enters the match illegally. He covers Hawk and the nation wins the match. The Road Warriors chase the Godwins back up the entranceway and Farouk wants to cut a promo. Vince gets in the ring and Farouk wants to know why Vader was chosen as the number one contender for the WWF Championship and why the nation is once again getting overlooked. Farouk believes because Ahmed was in the nation then the shot should go to another nation member. Vince doesn't have an answer except Vader was chosen and Farouk says that once again this is because of the colour of his skin. Dilo gives Vince the recap while also telling the chairman to shut up. Vince just stands there and takes it. In regards to Crush, Farouk also believes that the dirty old assholes were sent by The Undertaker. But never mind that, here comes Savio Vega. Savio says he quit the nation and he didn't get fired just like Crush last week. Farouk tells Savio to get in the ring for a fight. But guess what? Savio has his own faction. Say hello to Los Bariquas. And I really want to know who thought it was a good idea to give Crush and Savio their own factions because this is just fucking ridiculous. The two factions brawl and the DOA show up, we have another big fight and the only positive I can take out of this is that there's nothing I need to talk about, there's nothing I can say, it's a brawl, nobody gets the upper hand and the police have to jump in the ring to break things up, absolute horseshit. Raw was doing just fine without this. Scott Putsky vs Brian Christopher on Raw, Hulk Hogan cuts a promo on Nitro, we have a Steve Regal vs Hector Garza match too. Bischoff comes out on a motorcycle while Hogan does the tedious act of walking to the ring. Hulk says when you love the NWO, you love the NWO for life. Hulk said he enjoyed destroying that big, ward infested, stinky giant and flexi lexi with the help of Dennis Rodman, but tonight he's gonna let Randy Savage, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash have a little fun. Hulk announces a six man tag, these three guys are going to take on Team Giant Package and DDPP. Yeah, he said DDPP. Bischoff confirms Nash is going to wrestle twice tonight and Hogan talks about partying with the Brotherhood tonight. He keeps pointing to the crowd but we don't see who he's talking about so we assume it's the Las Vegas chapter Brotherhood Motorcycle Club or something but we don't see them. More dirty old assholes on Monday Night Wrestling shows though, fantastic. And that's it really, Hogan plugs the Bash at the Beach match a little more, he talks about the NWO destroying Paige, Luger and Giant later on, standard stuff. William Regal took on Hector Garza next, could Hector or Hector pull off the corkscrew plancha this week? Garza, That'll be a no then. He tried to make up for it with this lion salt that would have looked great but Regal got the knees up. The Regal stretch immediately follows and Steve Regal retains his TV title. On Raw, the Raw magazine gets advertised, there's a photo shoot in there with Sonny for all you hornballs out there, but there's also some candid photos of Sonny hanging out with a member of the Heart Foundation. Is it Brett that's been seeing Sonny days? Maybe Davey was caught in the act as we all know Sonny likes a bit of the bulldog? Oh no, Brian Pillman is also having Sonny days it seems. Jim Neidhart is patiently stroking his beard while waiting for his turn. Scott Putzke comes to the ring, straight edge Scott Putzke, all natural Scott Putzke, absolutely not enhanced in any way Scott Putzke. Jerry Dollar still doesn't want to discuss his relationship with Brian Christopher and he tells McMahon and Ross to mind their own business. Christopher bumps around the ring for Putzke during the early portion of the match but he comes back with a full Nelson face buster or a skull crushing finale. Brian follows this up with a Northern Lights suplex that looked good but his Hurricane Rana attempt gets countered with a sit down powerbomb. Putzke then goes upstairs and he hits a splash and this forces Jerry Lawler to jump on the apron to cause a distraction. Putzke overcomes this by throwing Christopher into Lawler but Jerry comes back and he grabs Scott's leg. Brian rolls his opponent up and he scores the win. The Lawlers then attack Scott after the match and we see a spike pile driver. Jerry and Brian cut a promo afterwards and it looks like Brian totally forgot what he was going to say. Go home and let your daddy let your daddy, let your daddy, <laughs> biker Michael Hackers. After the match, Vince McMahon shows fans a clip from Steve Austin's VHS tape. 
It includes Austin and ECW imitating Hulk Hogan, and McMahon and Ross have a good laugh about this. Ross says Austin talks about more superstars in the tape who should remain nameless. We have another Brand Pullman vs Mankind match next on Raw while Psychosis battles Super Colo on Nitro. Before the match, the Steiners come out and they say the Outsiders still owe them a tag team title match. I thought Harlem Heat were the number one contender, saying they beat Rick and Scott at the Great American Bash, so I don't know what's going on, sometimes you just gotta roll with it. The NWB team music plays and the Wolfpack walks out. The guys in the truck quickly notice the mistake and they change the music. Oh my, well, here they come. I'm surprised I got And then the B team come out afterwards. Scott Hall says if the Steiners were in their gear, the Outsiders would give them a wrestling lesson right now. But Scott has a contract and he wants to give it to the Steiners. Hall says this will give the Steiners a shot at the gold. Rick and Scott sign the contract and they walk away. Hall then says those Einsteiners haven't been the same since the car accident because they didn't read over the contract. Mean Gene has a look and it says in order for the Steiners to get a shot at the Outsiders, they first have to go through Masahiro Chono and the Great Muda. That match takes place at Bash at the Beach, so it's one more for the good guys. Sonny Ono couldn't help himself during the Psychosis vs Kolo match. He brought Kolo down with a few kicks and this led to Psychosis taking the lead. Kolo got hit with a baseball slide but he managed to dodge Psychosis' top rope dive to the outside. The guardrail bump here looked really good. Ono stops Kolo from suplexing Psychosis back in the ring. Psychosis then pins Kolo and Ono was supposed to hold Kolo down but he couldn't reach. Still, it's a victory for Psychosis. Kolo hits a hard back elbow after the match and he begins attacking Psychosis like the sore loser he is. The Parker comes down holding a wooden chair and it gets broke over Kolo's back. Juventud Guerrera then comes down to save the day. I'm not sure I'd want this botchy boy helping me out, but he gets the job done and he gets Psychosis and La Parka out of the ring. A very short match, nothing more to say. On Raw, The Undertaker, wearing casual clothes, well, casual for The Undertaker, says that tonight we're going to hear about the worst night of his life. Though the version Paul Bear tells will be slanted, Taker says the events of that night are burned in his mind and he's carried this for 20 years, but the dead man wants the fans to give him an opportunity to tell his side of the story too. We then learn that the great Suzuki will take on Takamichi Noku in a light heavyweight match at Canadian Stampede. That sounds interesting. And then we go to the ring for the Brand Pullman vs Mankind rematch. Mankind once again wears the Pick Me Steve sign around his neck and he has a gift for Jim Ross. Foley wants to apologize for attacking Ross during his sit down interview. And inside the gift box is a Mankind hand complete with a mandible claw. Bran Pillman takes it away and he shoves a finger in Mankind's eye. Nice. Back in the ring, Pillman's top rope move gets stopped with a back elbow. Steve Austin then cuts a split screen promo where he says Mankind sucks. You don't know if you're getting Mankind, Cactus Jack or Dude Love with this guy, so Austin doesn't want him as a partner. Stone Cold says no matter what happens, the tag titles are staying with Stone Cold. Before we go to commercial break, we see Triple H in China standing at the entranceway. We come back and Mankind hits a baseball slide, but Pillman evens the odds with a ring bell shot. Foley gets his head rammed in the ring post. Pillman then targets Foley's ear or his half ear and Bran even tries to use a pencil here, Jesus Christ. Pillman manages to stay in control at the other side of the ring when Foley runs into the steps. Brian then bites at Mankind's ear in the ring and he spits on Foley. The loose cannon is getting seriously vicious here, but Mankind turns it around with a ring post nut shot. Brian sells this wonderfully. Foley then signals for the mandible claw, this should be all over, but Triple H runs down the entranceway to break things up. Foley takes care of Hunter with a right hand followed by a mandible claw on the outside, but a china distraction allows Pillman to hit Mankind with his boot. On the outside we see a pathetic accidental chair shot from Triple H, made even worse because the chair was padded, and Mankind chases Hunter back up the entranceway. Mankind screams Helmsley's name into the microphone before Raw moves on, and this wasn't a bad match at all. Paul Bear reveals The Undertaker's dark secret next on Raw while two matches take place on Nitro, the NWO consisting of Bagwell, Norton and Chono versus The Horseman consisting of Mongo, Benoit and Ric Flair, and we also have Wrath and Mortis versus High Voltage. 
WCW are trying to cram way too much into this show, it seems. It's one of those nights where nothing settles down. Masahiro Chono brings a katana to the ring, but you know what's even more deadly than a samurai sword? You guessed it, a magical motherfucking briefcase. Jeff Jarrett is still on horseman probation, Mongo faces Jarrett at the pay per view, while Chris Benoit gets Kevin Sullivan in a retirement match. It took a retirement match to end the Benoit vs Sullivan rivalry. This one could have been good if it was given more time. Bagwell got the better of Flair at the beginning of the match, Mongo had to overcome the NWO using underhanded tactics to keep him at bay, but the big man brought Chono to the horseman corner and things began turning around for the babyfaces. Or no, they aren't babyfaces are they? Uh. Benoit and Chono had a great exchange that ended with Chono taking the diving headbutt, but things quickly broke down and all six men began fighting. Vincent runs down and he causes the NWO to lose via disqualification, but Big Mongo doesn't let Vincent escape unharmed. A shot with the briefcase puts Vincent in a coma for a week and the horsemen celebrate in the ring. Tony Schiavone calls this a big win for the horsemen over the NWO and I say that's a load of nonsense. It's a DQ victory handed to the horsemen by Vincent and it was over the NWO B team. I enjoyed it while it lasted though, that's what she said. Next up we have the greatest tag team to ever grace our television screens, Wrath and Mortis, and they're gonna take on High Voltage. Again, don't get settled in for this one, there's no match here really. Mark Curtis decides to let the guys all stay in the ring at the same time, nobody gets sent to their corner, and Mortis and Wrath make easy work of High Voltage, Wrath in particular is doing some good damage. Just when you begin enjoying this beatdown of epic proportions, that no good son of a gun glacier shows up to cause a distraction. Wrath leaves the ring to take care of this little twerp, but that gives Ernest Miller a chance to hit a spin kick from the top rope, leading to Mortis getting pinned by Robbie Rage. Low down, scummy, dirty, stinking, rotten hyena cheating bastards. Vandenberg says Ice Ice maybe are gonna pay for this, and I really hope they do. The secret then on Raw, everyone watching this will know what it is, and I've covered this before I think in two videos, so we'll get through this as fast as possible, but to change things up I'm gonna try to tell this story using nothing but stock footage. It's a challenge because I don't know what stock footage I have, so I'm gonna curse myself when editing this video later on, but let's see how it turns out. Before that though, a creature of the night tackles Paul Bear as Paul tries to get in the ring. The WWF thought that The Undertaker's most hardcore fans were unstable goths. So let's roll the stock footage. Paul says we're gonna go back 20 years, we're at a funeral home on the hill, beautiful oak trees all around. A family owned the funeral home, they lived upstairs. Uh, wait, fucking Vince McMahon is corpsing hard here, this isn't funny Vinnie Mac, get it together. Right, family owned funeral home. The dad was the mortician, the mother was the secretary, and there were two little kiddos. One was a little red-headed punk, The Undertaker, and the other was a sweet little kid. His name was Cain. Paul worked as an apprentice at the funeral home and he saw a lot of things that shouldn't have been happening. That little red-headed shitbag, he had the look of the devil in his eyes, but Cain, he looked up to his big brother. The brothers would run around the funeral home like wild men, they'd sneak around the garage, they'd smoke a few ciggies, but one afternoon when Paul had to go to school he backed his car out of the funeral home and he sees the undertaker with his little brother and something was funny, something didn't seem right. Paul went to school that day and he came back later in the evening and what does Paul see? Fire trucks, ambulances, smoke and the funeral home up in flames. Someone burned down the funeral home, Paul looks over at the bushes and there's the undertaker. Taker burned the funeral home down to the ground and along with the funeral home, the undertaker killed his family. We go back to the arena, the lights begin to flicker, we hear the sound of thunder and Raw goes to a commercial break. Spooky shit. Owen and Davey vs the Headbangers next, thank god I need some comic relief. And on Nitro we have Conan vs Double J. Hey, I thought horseman probation meant no wrestling. A white limo sits outside the arena, inside is the impact player, but he or she isn't ready to come out yet. We go to the arena and there he is, 
Raven is sitting in the audience and he looks fucking bored. Quick, someone do something that pleases the almighty Raven. Mike Tanay says Raven has not signed a WCW contract, which was bullshit of course, but Raven supposedly isn't part of the WCW roster. Jarrett takes Conan down with a clothesline and he performs the strut. Conan ducks out of an enziguri. He tells Double J he's a fraud who didn't really sing with my baby tonight while Jarrett cries. Conan then hits a dropkick on a seated Jarrett, but Double J comes back with a DDT. Jarrett then lands a few punches in the corner, Conan fires back with an elbow. Conan then stretches Double J out a bit, but it doesn't take long for Jarrett to come back once again, and he begins working over the leg. Here comes Ric Flair, Benoit and Mongo. Not sure what to expect here, we assume Flair's gonna go nuts for Jarrett breaking horseman probation. But no, they've done it again. They wipe out weeks of Horseman's storyline by having Ric Flair help Double J to win the match via submission. I give up. I'm just gonna say it. I hate the Four Horsemen. Here we go, another promo where we pretend like nothing happened. But oh no wait, Ric Flair says Jarrett's a fine athlete and a great young man, but as of this moment, Double J is no longer a Horseman. Jarrett protests, but Flair says Double J's out and the only reason he stayed around this long was because Debra took a liking to him. Debra, she says that Jarrett stinks, thanks for your input. Jarrett says Flair just loaded the gun and put the pistol to his own head, Double J will be the one who pulls the trigger, and Flair will be put out the pasture. Rick tells Jarrett not to overstay his welcome, and Double J leaves the ring. I'm gonna say it, I love the four horsemen. Over on Raw, Sable shows off the casket full of money, but again, Mark Merrow doesn't seem too pleased about this. He's looking at you, right now, and he's telling you to stop looking at his wife's jigglypuffs. The first clue in order to win this million dollars is the key. Okay guys, we're gonna solve this over the next few weeks. Remember the key, because I'll forget. Davey's been clean off the chin locks for one week, guys. Let's see if he can continue on his path to redemption. Bret Hart calls in during the match from Calgary. He's getting ready for the Canadian Stampede and he says the Calgary fans will show everyone what the whole world thinks of America. He calls Steve Austin a maggot, a living hyena piece of scum, and all of Team America is going to realize that they're on the wrong side when they visit Calgary. No chin locks so far. Bret says we might see the old Bret Hart at Canadian Stampede, meaning he's gonna be a babyface at the show. The Canadian fans will get what they want, but the American fans certainly will not. Still no chin locks. We assume Bret's staying in Calgary to promote In Your House, and he's pretty confident in his words. The pink and black attack will reign supreme this Sunday on pay per view. And a big heartfelt congratulations to Davy Boy Smith, he got through it. Bulldog knocks Thrasher off the top rope while Owen pins Mosh. Good stuff. Davy is still clean. We then hear a familiar voice. Congratulations, boys! What? Jim Cornette's back and he has a tag team he wants to show Owen and Davy. These two guys couldn't make it in time for the tag team tournament, but they're here now. And out comes. <laughs> yeah, out... sorry, I gotta say that again. These aren't big eggs with fast moving legs, this is the Headhunters, renamed the Arabian Butchers. And you know how many matches they'd have during this 1997 run in the World Wrestling Federation? Zero. Absolutely none. I'm pretty sure they disappear after this appearance. Cornette said Davey and Owen didn't want to do business with these guys, there was no guarantee they were gonna stay. And Davey won't let these guys attack him, he instead slams a Headhunter and rolls out of the ring. And the headbangers end up taking the beating, not Owen and Davey. That's fucking class. Look at how this Arabian butcher hits the ropes. <laughs> and to their credit, one of them pulls off a moonsault. Apparently, these guys did have good matches in Japan, but I've never seen them. Cornette said that backstage, Owen Hart couldn't stop laughing at Bulldog body slamming one of these guys, and that makes this run in totally worth it. Undertaker cuts a promo next and we have Rockabilly vs Vader. On Nitro, Rey Mysterio does battle with Kevin Nash. So what does The Undertaker have to say about being a GODDAMN MURDERER? Taker says he and his brother were playing with matches that day and they were playing around with flammable liquids. Taker and Kane got punished by Daddy Taker and both kids were sent on their way. 
Later on in the evening, Undertaker was leaving the funeral home, and he saw his little brother leaving the embalming room holding the flammable liquids. Taker then came back that night and he heard sirens, he saw the smoke filling the sky, he knew what happened straight away. He ran as fast as he could and when he got to the funeral home it was engulfed in flames. Undertaker went for the front door but he was pulled back by firefighters. The Undertaker watched the funeral home burn to the ground with his parents and his little brother inside. Taker says he didn't attend the funeral because Paul Bearer brought him to the neighbouring funeral home to see his family, and the image of Taker's mother laying on the table haunts him to this day. Taker didn't want to see it but Paul made the Undertaker look at the charred remains of his family, a day that changed the dead man forever. To deal with this tragedy, the Phenom had to look at death and understand that without death, there can't be life, so Taker took it upon himself to walk a path that others don't choose to. Taker draws the spirits of the dead, and the spirits of his parents and his little brother will strike Paul down. We just heard the origin story of The Undertaker seven years after his debut, that's pretty impressive. From this fascinating piece of character work to Rockabilly, you kinda snap back to reality when you hear Rockabilly's theme music in the arena. Don't worry though, the dead man interrupts this one and he goes after Vader, this happens very early in the match. First, gotta bring attention to this hard man right here, he thinks he could kick Rockabilly's ass and I'll bet anything that he couldn't. So yeah, the dead man runs down, he beats up Vader, Paul starts calling him a murderer and so the Undertaker slaps the shit out of him repeatedly. Taker tells Paul to tell the truth, and Paul says he did tell the truth because he heard it all from Taker's little brother. That's right, Cain is still alive, and the Undertaker doesn't seem to believe it seeing as he continues to pimp slap the shit out of Bearer mid promo. Vader gets in a cheap shot and he and Paul escape up the entrance way, and the Undertaker's left wondering if Paul's words are actually true. Great work here by the way, I thought all of this was really well done. Nash vs Mysterio is another non-starter, well it does start but it's a squash, it might as well not have been booked. Ray lands 3 drop kicks at the opening bell and he also hits a springboard somersault senton. This gets the crowd all fired up, but Nash then puts an end to the offense with an inverted atomic drop that made Ray's asshole fall out of his mouth. Nash then throws Ray as high and as far as he possibly can, Ray then takes a jackknife and that's it over, destruction from Big Sexy. The referee tries to stop Nash from hitting another jackknife but he does it anyway and the ref gets floored afterwards. Nash goes for a third jackknife but then Conan comes out. Nash again hits the jackknife anyway and Conan makes his way down to the ring. Nash just nods at Conan before leaving. We think Conan is going to help Ray, but he tries to dislocate his knee instead. The commentators wonder if Nash and Conan had some sort of arrangement, but that's how it ended. Ray gets taken out on a stretcher, and now we wonder if Conan has ties to the NWO. If you like seeing how far someone can throw Rey Mysterio, then this is the match for you. We arrive at our main events, we've got that NWO vs Giant package and DDP match on Nitro, on Raw we've got Jim the Anvil Nightheart vs Steve Austin. The Raw main event doesn't sound like a barn burner at all but let's check it out anyway. The Hart Foundation watched this one in the back, probably still laughing about Davey body slamming that headhunter guy. The Anvil attacks right at the opening bell and we cut away again to Kenny Boy Shamrock watching the match too. The crowd pops when Austin begins unloading on the Anvil with rights and lefts and Stone Cold follows this up with two hard clotheslines. Austin then applies a side headlock, Anvil with a top wrist lock into a side headlock of his own, Stone Cold goes down after a shoulder block, Jim applies another side headlock, and we see another shoulder block, sweet. Stone Cold's Luthez press doesn't look too hot afterwards, Stone Cold then goes for a sharpshooter but he gets kicked away, we get a good long abdominal stretch with a little rope leverage, everyone loves seeing that one don't they? Eventually the two end up on the outside and Stone Cold hits a slam on the rampway. We go to commercial break and during the commercial, Bret Hart showed up and he attacked Ken Shamrock. Ken doesn't have the jam. And speaking of jam, remember I asked you guys last week to send me your sick photos with Reliving the War merch? Well, check this out. This is Chief Big Canoe and they don't call him Chief Big Canoe for nothing. A majestic photo in the snow, the glorious winged eagle belt, the Brett's jam shirt, the glasses, a consummate professional ladies and gentlemen, a jam up guy, so well done man. 
Back to Raw, and Bret had us all fooled. He wasn't in Calgary at all, and Ken gets his ass kicked courtesy of His Excellency. In the ring, Jim Neidhart's looking fucking tired as he chokes Austin on the mat. He gets launched off the ropes and he kicks Stone Cold as if to say, nah, I'm not doing anything else. And then he performs a chin lock. Fortunately, Davey went to the toilet and he didn't have to see this. No relapsing this week on Reliving the War. Austin fights out, Anvil applies a sleeper, Stone Cold catches flies and we see the jawbreaker. Anvil then stops the action again with another rest hold, a front face lock. Jim uses his last bit of energy to hit a body slam. He dives from the middle rope, but he misses his target. Stone Cold begins firing up, but before he can put the match away, Bret Hart interferes. The ref calls for a DQ as the original Hart Foundation teach Stone Cold a lesson. Bret applies the figure four around the ring post, and this prompts Mankind to hit the ringside area to save Austin. Bret gets put in the mandible claw, and Raw ends with the Hart Foundation smacking Foley with steel chairs to break the hold. These hard boys are becoming a little like the NWO with all these DQ finishes. Not a great main event on Raw, sadly. Mike Tanay tries to interview Raven, but the former ECW champion isn't saying a word. Tanay wants to know if Raven's DDP's mystery partner at Bash at the Beach, or if Raven's had any contract discussions with WCW, but he isn't answering. Raven's being all moody and cool and shit. Kevin Nash is wearing a wig and even the commentators have no idea what he's doing or why he's doing it. I assume he got that from the Roddy Piper mannequin. Out comes Flexi Lexi, the big stinky giant in DDPP. We go to commercial break and Tony Schiavone explains that the NWO wouldn't let the babyfaces step into the ring while the cameras weren't rolling. The fight starts with Paige pulling Macho out of the ring while DDP and the giant finally get a chance to enter. Paige stays on Macho, we have a giant vs Nash fight and Lex Luger tries to deal with the bad guy. There's no tags here, this is the match, it's just six guys fighting. Giant hits a headbutt on both outsiders at the same time, but he gets dumped over the ring afterwards. Hollywood Hogan then shows up and he distracts Lex Luger. Luger sees the Scott Hall sneak attack coming, but Hogan still clocks Luger with the world belt. And then the rest of the NWO come down. Team Giant package get taken care of on the outside, while DDP gets destroyed inside the ropes. Macho hits the elbow drop twice on Dallas, and then shit haircut Sting shows up in the audience. The haircut was just a distraction though as the real Sting comes down from the rafters afterwards, and he's here once again to protect DDP. He's like Dallas's guardian angel. The Impact player then makes his way down to the ring and Kurt Hennig is now part of WCW. But then Raven jumps the guardrail and the commentators wonder what this means. Is Raven here to help Dallas? Is Hennig the mystery tag partner? All will be revealed next week, or it probably won't. Same Nitro time, same Nitro channel. I'm giving the point to Raw this week and that's thanks to the great work of Paul Bearer and The Undertaker. The story told on WWF Raw would have a huge amount of importance and it's something the WWF would carry on for years to come. The main event wasn't good, but the rest of the matches were better than Nitro's. Nitro suffered again due to the terribly short matches and everything was at a breakneck speed, although Raven showing up was good, as was Kurt Hennig's debut. Raw's now on 37 points, Nitro has 41, and we've had 12 ties. Another 3.3 for Nitro this week in the television ratings, while Raw scores a 2.5. As mentioned, Canadian Stampede is already on the channel, so you can check that out right now if you want to see what happened in Calgary. Raw comes from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada next week and the Hitman wrestles in the main event. Owen and Davey face the Nation of Domination, and Takamichi Noku faces the Great Suzuki in a Canadian Stampede rematch. On Nitro, Vicious and Delicious take on Eddie and Chavo, Randy Savage takes on La Parka, mm -hmm. and uh, these two have a match. Much thanks to each and every one of you for watching Reliving the War. I hope you enjoyed this one and take care.